Well, good morning, Calvary. I am so glad that I have this opportunity to share with you. Last week at the elders meeting, they asked if I would do a, a five minute goodbye video, and I said I would consider it. But the next morning when I woke up and I was spending time with Jesus, I just felt God put three things on my heart that I could share with you. And uh, I'm thrilled to do so. I feel like it's kind of my last pastoral task here at Calvary. But before I share them with you, I thought it would be good for me to just tell you about my journey uh, to Calvary and, um, and my time here. John and I came to this church, wow, 23 years ago. We had moved from Burnaby to Coquitlam because we couldn't afford a house in Burnaby or New Westminster. And I'm not from the Lower Mainland. And so I remember thinking as we drove out here, where in the world is Coquitlam? It just felt like the boonies. But once we found a place to stay, it was time to find a church. And so John and I started visiting different churches. But I always remember when we walked into Calvary with our infant son, and we just knew it was a church. It wasn't the pastors, it wasn't the programs, it was the people. Just such incredibly friendly people. And so when my son and daughter were about elementary school age, Pastor Todd um, had asked me to help out because our children's director at the time, she had stepped down. And I was working as an x-ray tech, but Todd said to me, hey, Michelle, you know, could you just kind of oversee the children's programming for the fall? We're, we're putting together a search committee. Uh, we're we're going to, you know, we're going to find a replacement. And he said, Amanda Ballard, who was working in the office at the time, you know, she can help you. So I'm like, sure, that, that sounds like a good challenge. I'd enjoy that. But after working with the children and their families for a few months, oh, I, I felt that nudge, you know, that only the Holy Spirit can give. And I applied for the job myself. I think that was a surprise for pretty much everyone and definitely an unexpected detour in my life. In the five years that I was in that position, I just fell in love with Calvary, fell in love with the, the mission of this church. I, I loved how we reached out to others in the community. You know, it was during that time that Soul Food came about. Um, Soul Food was our ministry to homeless people. We fed 60 to 70 people every Sunday evening. Uh, we did that for three years. There was also the Roy Stibbs School, and our, our church really embraced that school, um, helped them with finances and manpower, especially because they were just a school that had many people that were new to Canada or perhaps, you know, just had some financial struggles. Also, we had the high five groups. So both men and women worked with this prison ministry. So five people would work together to walk alongside a new friend that had just gotten out of prison, had transitioned into the community, um, but they wanted to get involved in a faith community, but they didn't feel like they could just walk into a church on their own. And so these were some of the things I just loved, um, you know, working at Calvary with and for. Now, if you've been at Calvary for a while, you'll remember Pastor Todd. And he became ill, and so he could no longer work here. And that's when we had Pastor Chris. And Pastor Chris came on just kind of at the tail end of my working in children's ministries. And both he and I really had the desire that my role would morph into something just a little more suitable for my giftings and my calling. But then was not to be the time. So my husband and I, and trust me, my husband has just been so incredibly supportive of me, you know, as this entire journey that I've walked. So we decided that I would go back working as an x-ray tech for two days, but that I would give myself as a volunteer to Calvary three days a week. And during that time, there was um, Freedom Session, which was our recovery ministry, Alpha, prayer ministry, small groups. I even did a term as an elder. And then, of course, we get to 2014. And I started at Acts Seminaries. And after three years, uh, both Pastor Chris and I graduated with our master's degree. And so that brings me actually to um, the three things that I wanted to share with you. And I don't usually like to do, you know, cheesy sermon titles, but today <laughs> I'm gonna use some good old alliteration because it helps us remember. And so all the three points are gonna begin with the letter L, you know, just like Sesame Street. 
And so the first point is learn. I want to encourage you to always be learners. Never stop learning. When I was in grade 12, I did a high school year in Belgium and I lived with this French family and, and we went to church together. And I remember one day that I'd asked them for a French Bible and they just looked at me strangely. And they're like, oh, well, we don't have any. We, we go to church, our priest reads it for us and he tells us what to believe. Well, that doesn't have to be our story. You know, last month we, we talked about how the Apostle Paul went to the Bereans in Acts chapter 17 and he was teaching them and they were listening enthusiastically. And then we're told that every day they went and they studied the scriptures to see if what Paul was telling them was true. And, um, and they were eager to learn. They were eager to discuss things with their faith community. I mean, you have to remember, I mean, what they had up to that time was the Mosaic law and their religious traditions. So a lot of the stuff that Paul would have been telling them would have been something that was new to their ears. I, I loved my seminary experience. Not only did it fill my head full of knowledge, it made me love Jesus all the more. And one of the great benefits of Acts is it's actually a consortium of, of seminaries, which meant that my professors and my fellow students were um, from different denominations. And that meant that when we were discussing theology or the scriptures, that the other Christians in the room actually had different thoughts and ideas on things than I did. And you know, this is why Pastor Chris and I have been really um, intentional about getting lots of books for the Resource Center. You know, books that go along with what we're studying in the sermons. There's so many good books in there, and yet, you know, only one or two books are checked out every week. I would really encourage you to use the Resource Center. And hey, you might not be a reader, not everybody is, but you know, there's podcasts, there's audio books, or you could join a small group and, and go there to discuss issues of faith and theology. Um, one of the things that I, I'm very intentional about is, and I'm getting better at this, is to read books written by authors that I don't necessarily agree with. And a lot of times they don't sway me to their theology, their way of thinking, but boy, they give me ideas to think about. Things that had never occurred to me. And you know, it is good. It is good to learn what other Christians believe. It's good to, to know what non-Christians believe. Because for starters, it helps you be respectful of what other people believe, but also how can you be persuasive about what you actually believe when you don't even know what other people believe? I, I was reading um, the CNN app this week. I usually read it every morning. And there are other things on there other than the impeachment, uh, the impeachment trial. And one of the, the headlines was that in Dallas, Texas this past week, there was the third annual Flat Earth International Conference. And next year, they're hoping to have this conference in every country in the world. And I read that and I thought, wow, this is why we do theology together. Because if you only spend time discussing things with people who think exactly like you, boy, that can take you down a misguided path, right? 2 Timothy 3.16 says that all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting. I'm going to stop right there for a moment. Why would it need to teach us and rebuke us and correct us? if we're already certain we know everything it has to tell us. I mean, just yesterday, I heard a story of a man in his 70s, um, a professor, a scholar, who said in the last few years of his life, he has changed his mind on issues of theology than he has in his whole life. Because he's a man who's not afraid of learning.
He's a man who continues to desire to learn. So if we read the scriptures and our only goal is to read them to affirm what we already know, then we are not allowing the inspired word of God to work in us, to challenge us, to teach us, correct us, rebuke us. You know, with the invention of the printing press in the 15th century, people could have the scriptures finally for themselves because up until that point, and many of them were illiterate as well, they would come to church and it would be their priests who would read the scriptures, interpret them, and tell them how to apply it to their lives. And this brings me to my second point, my second L, and that's the word lead. Lead, because I want to talk about the priesthood of all believers. Because in the Baptist denomination, that is one of the core tenets. Um, when I candidated for my role as associate pastor, I preached a sermon on the priesthood of all believers. Let me just read you one verse. It, it comes from 1 Peter 2.9, and it says, But you, so people who are Christians, people who follow Jesus, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. See, in the Old Testament, the only people that could approach God were the priests. And if we now as believers under the new covenant are all called priests, well, what does that mean for us? Well, it means that even though I'm leaving and Pastor Jordan is leaving, the Calvary is going to be fine because this is a room filled with people that are filled with the Spirit of God. In this room, there are other pastors and, and there are teachers and administrators and leaders and gifted intercessors, and people who are just so gifted with mercy and have hearts full of compassion, people who believe in the healing of Jesus and, and pray for others to be healed. You know, myself, along with the other paid staff, yeah, we, we teach the Word of God and we help people apply it. But just because we're not here, that doesn't mean you're left helpless. Each of you is a priest. Each of you has the spirit, which means that you can read those God-inspired scriptures and the spirit will speak to you about them and teach you about them and you can teach others. So every man, every woman, every teenager sitting in these pews is a priest. I want you to take a moment right now and do something for me. I want you to look at the person on your left and then look at the person on your right. And if you're at the end of the pew, maybe you have to look at the person behind you. I want you to have a good look at their faces. So I'm gonna give you a minute. You go ahead and you do that. Now, I can see you. And I know that not all of you have done it. So I'm gonna give you another opportunity. But what I want you to do this time is, if you don't know the name of the person right beside you, I want you to ask their name, okay? So go ahead, I'm gonna give you another opportunity to do that. The reason I've asked you to do that is because this week, I want you to pray for those two people because they are your co-priests in the church. The Spirit of God has gifted them, equipped them to do whatever He has called them to do. Look, if you had lived 500 years ago and you had wanted to get together with other people to read the Word, to pray, to worship God, you know what the response would have been? It would have been no. How dare you think 
that you can teach and mentor other believers. That is a job of your priest, your pastor. In 1517, Martin Luther, he nailed his 95 theses to the church door and the Reformation began. But even with all the good things that came out of the Reformation, in 1675, there was a man from Germany named Philip Spenner and he was quite dismayed with the immorality of the church leaders and what he perceived as a very dry, inauthentic faith of, of the congregants. And so himself, along with other leaders, were part of leading a new spiritual movement called the Pietist Movement that just swept through North America and Europe. And two of the core tenets of Pietism was, first was the priesthood of all believers, which we just spoke about a moment ago. That means that this gap, the gap between the clergy and the members of congregation was removed. That everybody is invited into this priestly role. Every believer can connect with God personally and also be a bridge builder to help others connect with God. And that brings us to one of the second things that pietism brought about. I mean, with this, this notion of kind of a common priesthood, there was a need for people to get together, to read the Bible, to pray, to discuss theology. And so these group form, and, and they were called conventicles. Now, we would call them small groups. And the pietist leaders even had the nerve to tell the people that they could challenge their leaders about what the Bible said. Now, for obvious reasons, <laughs> this made the church leaders very angry and Philip Spenner was actually kicked out of the church. But to this day, small groups are, are a part of most Christian churches. This brings us to the third L, my third point. And that is love. As priests in, in Jesus' kingdom, we are called to love God and to introduce other people to the love of God. Uh, two weeks ago, on a Sunday morning, the first Sunday I missed being at Calvary, I decided to go for a walk. And, and I went for a walk on a route that I'd never taken before. And this route took me through a cemetery. And as I was walking through the cemetery, there was this man, he was about in his 80s, he was sitting in a chair uh, just by a headstone. I gave him a nod, he nodded back. On Monday morning, I thought, you know, that was a good walk. I'm gonna do that same route again. So I went back and, and I walked through the same cemetery, cemetery and, and that same man was there. And so this time I gave him a little wave and, and he gave me a little wave back. I thought, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go over and talk to him. So I walked over there and I said, hey, I think I saw you here yesterday. And he's like, oh, I'm here every day. Every day for four to five hours. You see, he had been married for 58 years and his wife died last year. And he told me that he comes and he sits by her headstone four to five hours a day. He said, I don't have any hope, I don't have any purpose. I'm just gonna sit here until it's my time to go and be with her. And so I asked him, I said, well, do you have any faith that helps you get through this time? And he said, no. And we talked for a bit more and, and I said to him, you know, Dave, I know you don't know me, but would it be okay if I prayed with you? He said, sure, go ahead. So I kneeled down and I kept my prayer very simple. I just prayed that Dave would know that there was a God who loved him. And then I prayed that even though he didn't have a lot of people in his life, that he would know that God was always with him. And the man just started to bawl and bawl and bawl. So we talked for a few more minutes and, and then I left, but I knew I would be coming back to see Dave. You know, Dave doesn't go to church. But God loves Dave so much, he sent one of his priests 
to go see him and to pray with him and to help just even introduce the idea that there was a God who loves him. You know, it's really good. It's so important that we come together on a Sunday morning like this to worship God. That, that's our main purpose, to worship God and give him glory in everything. But boy, we have to get outside these four walls because there's people like Dave who sit in a cemetery four hours a day because he has no hope. We're the people of God. We're his priests. It is our job to take this message of hope through words and through actions to people who have no hope. A couple weeks ago, uh, a young woman in this church said to me, would, would I come and see a friend of hers? This other young woman, she believed in God, but she had questions about who Jesus was. So of course I went. And when I got there, she said, yeah, I mean, of course I believe in God, but Jesus, I mean, who's Jesus? And I was able to say to her with all assurance, oh, well, see, Jesus is God. He is God who came in the person of Jesus in the flesh on earth so that we could witness, or the people of that day could witness firsthand, you know, the, the power of God, his teachings, his character, and of course, most importantly, his love. And that for the people who got to know Jesus, got to know God, they all know also witnessed his death and at his resurrection. Over 500 people spoke with Jesus, touched Jesus, got to see Jesus after he rose from the dead. And this is where we, as Christians, where we get our hope. Because on the cross, Jesus paid for our sins, bringing us back together in relationship with God. And through his resurrection, that means that we too will have resurrected bodies. And, and be able to live forever with God. I mean, there's no greater hope than that. And as priests of God, that is the message that we have been commissioned with to take to the world. Two weeks ago, um, a group in the community called Coast Mental Health, they, they worked down at Riverview Hospital, they came to our church because they wanted to... Um, brings them blankets for the people that were sleeping in our church with the MAP program. Because that's another wonderful way Calvary reaches out to the community, right? We have the homeless people sleep in our church for the month. And so it was actually their clients who made these stunning blankets, just gorgeous. And their clients spend a year there, and these are people that have struggled with addiction, uh, poor mental health, and some of them have been homeless. And so they came to the church and they presented these blankets to people who um, have been in, are in a position that they themselves have once been in. And so I got to meet the organizers and they invited John and I to, to come to their gala. So John and I went to their gala last week. And in this room of hundreds of people, you know, there was medical people, there was dignitaries, but three quarters of the room were filled with their clients, past and present. And the highlight of the evening was this open mic time. And this was a time where the clients were able to get up and share with everybody about their journey of healing. Oh, the stories were incredible. But one fellow said something that was so impactful. He said, rehab got me clean, but coast mental health, they taught me how to live. I thought, wow. That is beautiful. And that also is the challenge to the church today. As priests, we don't just take the hope of the message of Jesus to this world, but we are here to also help people to show them how to live. That there is a different way to live than the way the world shows them. And so I hope that is that you reflect on this message today, that you will ask God this week, 
you know, when you're praying for the two priests that are sitting beside you today, that you will say to God, God, how are we Calvary to love the people of the community in the world? And I know Calvary does lots of things, but God is calling us to so much more. You know, in Luke's gospel, Jesus speaks of the anointing that the Spirit has given him, um, part of his mission here on, on earth. And I'd like to read to you a few verses from Luke chapter 4. This is what Jesus says. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, right? Jesus came to save us, but not just to save us for the next life, but to save us when we're sick, when we're poor, when we're in prison, when we're oppressed. This is what the Spirit of God anointed Jesus to do while he was here on the earth. And it is also what the Spirit of God anoints us as his priests to do. And loving people sounds nice, right? I said the third L was love. And of course, we're all like, of course, love people. Who doesn't want to love people? But you know what? Loving people is often inconvenient. It, it can be hard work. A and loving people can be uncomfortable because often the people that we're called to love are very different than us. And so we really need to love Jesus more than we love our comfort. We need to love Jesus more than we love our religious traditions. Because when we are filled with the love of Jesus, then we can't help but take the love and hope of Jesus uh, to the people that God puts in our path. So Calvary, be encouraged because God has given you everything that you need as a church to move forward in his mission. Continue to learn, lead as his priests, and of course, love, love God and, and love other people. There's a lot going on at Calvary at this moment, but I am just so encouraged by the stories I hear. You know, in pre-service prayer every Sunday morning, typically we would have five to 10 people show up. But I heard last Sunday that there were 20 people that showed up who showed up for pre-service prayer. I mean, wouldn't it be amazing if so many people showed up for pre-service prayer that you could no longer do it in the upstairs room, you'd have to come down here? and do it in the sanctuary? Well, wouldn't that mean that I would have to come to church 45 minutes early? Yes, yes it would. And that's a small inconvenience for the incredible privilege to be a priest in the kingdom of God, to come and to lead by interceding for Calvary and for the community around us. So I'm not gonna say goodbye because I plan on continuing my relationships with the people here at this church. Um, my immediate plan is to take December and January off and then we'll just see where God leads. I am fully trusting that God has plans for me and I know that he definitely has great plans for you. And it would be my great honor right now to, to pray for you one, time, one last time. And as I was thinking, what would I want to pray for Calvary? I thought um, it would make sense to pray for you from the Word of God, but also to pray my favorite Bible passage over you in Ephesians 1. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. 
I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly realms. Far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is the body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Amen.